Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Julian Digby, Solutions Consultant at EdgeServe. Um, the topic of today's webinar is um, security um, in the cloud, security and access management in the cloud. So, next slide. Um, so, essentially, it is it is true with all ICT systems um, that uh, security uh, must be considered, and the security of specific systems and the data that they hold um, should be reviewed on a case by case basis. But what we want to talk about today is essentially what the difference is when you're hosting those services in the cloud. <clears throat> so in order to do that, it's worth looking at what what's different, what's the key set of differences between what's um, uh, a system that's hosted uh, on your on-premise network uh, versus in the public cloud. And I think um, it can probably be condensed down into these four bullets. So the first one being moving infrastructure and data to a third party facility. So essentially uh, where you were hosting things uh, on your own network, you're now hosting them on someone else's network, someone else's servers, and, and someone else is looking after those on your behalf. So that's obviously a very key difference. Um, a second difference is accessing services via the internet. Um, now this has various facets to it. So if you are looking at a, a software as, as a service model, um, such software as a service is generally presented via the internet. So you, uh, you know, a good example that a lot of people use is Office 365. Office 365 is, is accessed via the internet. Um, and you have access to your SharePoint sites and your email and so forth um, over uh, the public internet. Um, at a different level, where you might be using platform as a service, um, uh, services, the, um, take for example, a, a database service where uh, you're responsible for the database, but the actual database application and the, the servers uh, supporting that are, are managed by a third party. And quite often that database is exposed via the internet. Um, and so the, the internet is, is the network used to connect that to perhaps a, a, another application. Um, so there is more use of the internet um, to, to drive traffic within systems as well as um, between users and systems. Um, a third uh, area where there's a key difference is uh, a realignment of, of security skills across your staff. So uh, today, it's probably true that you have um, uh, ICT staff with, with a mixed skill set. And you know there might be a server expert. Uh, there might be a network expert. There might be a storage expert. And generally, they, you know, they would collaborate together to actually uh, deploy new services and so forth. Um, with the public cloud, uh, particularly, there's a need to, to share out the capability uh, of those disciplines um, so that uh, within one member of staff you have, have at least a good appreciation of uh, what needs to be done uh, in all of those three areas. Um, so we'll, we'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, and the final area is um, sensitive management interfaces being exposed to the internet. Now um, that is um, uh, Primarily, I, I guess, if, if you're using a, a, a vCenter um, VMware type environment today, uh, generally the access to the console um, with the privileged access that that provides will uh, be predicated on you being on your own network or from a, a key VPN location or, or other such um, uh, uh, controlled locations. Um, I won't be generally available on the internet. Um, no, it's because the cloud services are, are obviously in those management interfaces uh, on the internet and understanding how to control access to those uh, is pretty key in order to preserve the security of your systems. So on to the next slide. Um, so going back to the, the first of those, so moving infrastructure and data to a, to a third party supplier. Um, now essentially, you're extending your network uh, to um, to a, th a third party uh, organization and you 
have uh, good security practices within your own uh, network and you really want anybody who's um, uh, that you're extending your network to to, to have a, a similar quality of um, uh, of uh, security credentials or, or better hopefully um, so there are various uh, accreditations that um, a cloud service provider can can uh, uh, can exhibit um, key one being ISO 27001 uh, but there are some others that, that are potentially relevant uh, in different areas uh, cyber essentials plus um, the public services network accreditation um, and if you're hand handling payment card um, infrastructure of any type so you take making payments with credit card compliant badge as well and there are many others, uh, but I think these are probably the key ones. Um, now, these aren't the sort of last word on assessing somebody's security, but they are a, a useful shorthand. So, um, in order to pass an ISO 27001 um, uh, accreditation, they will have been audited uh, against um, a wide range of elements, uh, such as their, their internal processes, their security processes, things like separation of duties, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, they'll be audited regularly. They'll be subject to penetration tests. Um, and they'll have to uh, demonstrate what they, uh, you know, who's responsible for information uh, within their organization and what the procedures are if a, a data loss is, uh, or a data breach is suspected, um, and uh, how they will interact with their customers in order to uh, minimize the impact of such. The data loss. Um, so these are these are some key elements of, of ISO 27001, which you can be assured of by uh, the, the, the accreditation and the regular audit of the organisations. Um, that's not to say that if they don't have these badges, that they don't uh, follow these uh, these principles. Um, however, uh, it, it, it's a good indicator that someone, uh, you know, a third party, an independent third party, has been in um, and assessed their capabilities and decided that they're they're up to scratch. Um, so, I, I would suggest that these, you know, ISO 27001 is at least highly desirable. <clears throat> Just going back to the separation of duties. So, um, so one of the uh, the concerns people have when uh, moving data to the cloud um, is the idea that they're they're moving into a facility where um, you know they don't know the staff they have no sort of personal uh, involvement with uh, anybody who works at all that organization so it's a bit faceless and you're a bit concerned about who who has access to your data the separation of duties is essentially a principle that that um, uh, job roles are divided up uh, in such that um, no one person has enough uh, information and access to be able to exploit the data um, that's hosted on behalf of customers. So, for example, um, take an AWS case, um, the people who actually have physical access to servers um, and are able to actually go into data centers and touch servers and storage have absolutely no idea who is hosted on those servers. Um, they, you know, if they had a disk in their hand, they would not be able to tell you uh, whose data it was um, and you know what it what it's for, what it could be used for. Um, so, uh, likewise, somebody who did know that would never get access to the physical to the, to the data physically um, or logically. So, um, in order to um, you know, in order to uh, exploit the fact that the organization was hosting your data, uh, there would have to be collusion between various uh, different individuals um, and so forth. So that provides a, a significant um, uh, protection against, um, you know, one-off rogue operators um, accessing your data. Um, so another part of um, moving data, particularly to a, to a third party, um, it's making sure that your data is encrypted. Um, if, it, if it's appropriate that uh, this data uh, should not fall into other hands, then then data encryption is, is recommended. Um, so there's two parts to this, there's data at rest, so data sitting on storage devices, um, that wants to be encrypted. And uh, there is a, um, a requirement to, to manage encryption keys at that point. Um, so 
obviously there's no point in having a lock if you give everybody the key. Um, making sure that the people who have the key uh, are, are suitably trusted or uh, making sure that you are ultimately the only person with the key uh, or with access to the key um, uh, is also a, a, a good approach. Um, so again, an AWS example, um, you're able to decide whether your storage devices are encrypted with a key that they provide through their infrastructure or one that you provide. Um, and you know, depending on the, the, the circumstances, either may be appropriate, um, but it's, it's recognizing that it is a, a lock and key process and that uh, looking after the keys um, is, is a key consideration. Um, the other element of encryption is where data is being moved between systems and uh, the, uh, the you know, appropriate, um, especially ac across the internet, uh, the appropriate use of um, HTTPS and the TLS 1.2 encryption. Um, there are various earlier versions of HTTPS, um, but TLS 1.2 is the recommended one currently. Um, uh, and uh, you know that that level of encrypted data. So not using straightforward HTTP access between systems um, is definitely the way ahead. Um, so moving on then. So challenges of internet access services. Um, so initially, I uh, just want to talk about um, the more software as a service type solution. Um, so a, a solution a bit like Office 365 or um, uh, Salesforce and what have you, um, where um, access is over the internet. Um, how do you go about um, providing uh, secure access to that? So in terms of access control, um, the two main uh, things in your armory really are a strong password policy, ensuring that people uh, use strong passwords that are hard to crack. Um, and, uh, you know, um, with, with um, software as a service, um, you know, I, ideally the, the policy would be something that you could enable or it would be a default option um, that passwords must be strong. Um, but also where appropriate multi-factor authentication. So uh, multi-factor authentication, so using a uh, something like Google Authenticator or, or another app on a, a smartphone, uh, or being sent a text message with a with a code in that you have to enter, those types of um, uh, additional authentication um, have their place. Um, not all the time, perhaps. So, so an example would be um, if you're accessing this service outside of your your working office, outside of their network, uh, then it's probably right that multi-factor authentication is enabled. But it might be possible that um, you can enable that whilst. Uh, inside the organization, uh, MFA isn't actually required. And that gives you a, a slicker working practice, perhaps, uh, when you're in the office. Um, it's certainly something that EduServe makes use of um, with Office 365. So it's, it's a bit of a theme that, so, so making sure that your security controls are proportionate and you're balancing the, um, uh, the impact on users um, on using the system versus the security of the system. Um, and there may be factors like where that user is, is working from that actually um, uh, tip the balance uh, towards or, or away from things like multi-factor authentication. Uh, next slide. Um, so another element of um, uh, uh, the, the internet access services is that um, with a typical on-premise arrangement, you would have um, uh, typically uh, company-owned devices on a company-managed network um, accessing data on those services, and it's generally uh, it's not impossible, but it's, it, you know data will generally be held within uh, the organization's assets on the network um, and on the, the infrastructure, um, and it won't find its way. Uh, onto other systems and devices. Now with Office 365 as an example, um, the uh, access to, to data uh, held on this SaaS solution, this software as a service solution, um, uh, by default, it's possible to um, access that from, from any uh, device uh, with an internet connection onto, uh, onto Office 365. Um, 
and that might be just to, to view a document and that might actually stay within the system, but uh, potentially you could download that document and that doc document would then exist perhaps on the hard drive of another computer. Um, that computer might be one that's not sanctioned for use by the organization and so it might be a home computer. Um, worse, it could be something in an internet cafe if, if such things still exist. Um, certainly shared access computers exist. Um, and uh, you know, the proliferation of data and, and data lost through that process is, is, is not ideal. So, you know, what can you do about it? So, um, various uh, solutions will uh, will help you here. So, in an Office 365 environment, you can control which devices can access the, the service. Uh, so, you're able to, um, in, in, in the case of Microsoft's stack, use a, a product called Intune to define which um, app, or which devices are able to access uh, the service and also what their um, uh, security profile has to be in order for them to have access. So they have to have up-to-date antivirus, have to have their firewalls on, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, essentially uh, managing uh, the security stance of the devices that are accessing your data. Um, you can also control how data can be accessed. So um, within SharePoint Online, it's possible to, to view documents within the web portal um, and, and not download them. And you can actually prevent download. If, if, if it's appropriate, you can say, well, this document or, or the documents on this site are sensitive in nature and should not be downloaded. And that would prevent them appearing on the hard drives of, of uh, third-party computers. Um, so that's that's a good good tip. Um, another uh, tool in your armory is is um, uh, is audit. Uh, so audit doesn't prevent data loss, um, but it would let you see when it has occurred. So so understanding um, <clears throat> when data is downloaded, to where and by whom, uh, gives you a way to to review uh, what what practices are occurring within your organization um, and potentially um, uh, you know, address the human factor and ask your staff uh, to refrain from doing that. I think in a lot of cases where data is, it does find its way out of the organization. Um, <clears throat> it's not really for nefarious purposes. It's, it's generally because people don't realize and don't appreciate that um, data might be cached on a, on a hard drive or you know, the downloads folder gets f full of your, you know, on your home PCs, full of work documents. Um, in a lot of cases, your, your staff wouldn't you know, appreciate that initially. So I think an acceptable use policy that, that details um, what shouldn't be done and, and why not. So, you know, just make sure it doesn't appear overly draconian. Uh, you get more buy-in that way. Um, you know, it can go a long way to, to actually addressing this sort of issue. Um, on the flip side, the, the flexibility, especially if you've got uh, some elements of mobile workforce of being able to access um, organizational documents um, on mobile devices and, and, and laptops and so forth, whilst outside of the, the office, um, you know, that, that's, that, you know, obviously a clear winner um, and, and something that's uh, highly desirable in a lot of cases. Um, so you don't want to curtail that and stop that from being available uh, because of security reasons. Um, so again, it's all about proportionality and making sure um, uh, you make it sure that you, you have the right balance of usability and security. Um, and like I say, all of these according to the sensitivity, sensitivity of data and risk assessment. Um, so understanding what your uh, your appetite for risk is with any given system uh, is pretty key. Um, so moving on to securing cloud services. Um, so this is really a, a, under that third bullet point at the beginning about um, that mix of um, uh, skill set um, and the, the, the cloud security skill set being spread across um, uh, a, a, a broader set of people. So, so rather than a sort of siloed access, um, any one individual would have um, security responsibilities in a number of areas. <clears throat> um, so the, the security of cloud services really relies on the security features of the service and crucially how they are configured. Um, now the public cloud providers um, operate what they call a shared responsibility model. So um, in, in this, this, is, this diagram is the AWS diagram to, to, to illustrate this. Um, they are responsible for the security and, and the upkeep of everything in orange. And it's the customer's responsibility to look after everything that's been in blue. 
Um, so ultimately they're responsible for compute, storage, database, networking, the software that those run on, um, and the general networking infrastructure around uh, regions where things are hosted, availability zones, uh, and so forth. So they provide the platform to you, and it has a set of um, uh, features and capability that are available for you to configure um, to to ensure your security. So um, above that, the elements in blue uh, at, at the bottom there, client side, data encryption, data integrity, authentication, server side encryption, networking, traffic protection, and so forth. Uh, and then moving up through operating systems, firewalls, identity management, and so forth. So essentially, there are a lot of um, elements that need to be configured, as there are on an on-premise um, uh, service. Um, that uh, you know can make the difference between um, a secure system uh, and otherwise. I guess a key um, a key thing uh, that's worth considering is, is in an on-premise environment. You know, ultimately your edge firewall is a sort of last line of defence um, where uh, you know your your networking experts can prevent uh, data. Uh, transit that they, they, they don't see a, an appropriate reason for. Um, I think when it comes to public cloud, having uh, that level of understanding on all or, or, or a majority of people whose, whose job it is to configure uh, servers and networks within uh, the public cloud uh, is, is pretty key because they can, you know, by, by using a you know, particularly a PaaS solution, it, it's possible to misconfigure um, and have things uh, exposed to the internet and, uh, and uh, unauthorized users. I think there's been quite a bit in the press uh, recently about uh, Amazon S3 buckets, and S3 is a an internet access storage service. Uh, a bucket is essentially a, you know, a folder, if you like. Um, and by default, when you configure them, they they're open to everyone on the internet um, and you know, there's quite clearly a set of steps that you would take that that would lock that down to particular users and particular locations and so forth um, but there are people uh, who, who have made a point of, of going out and finding s3 buckets that seem to have things um, in them that uh, that you wouldn't generally want to share with the whole world um, demonstrating that some people are deploying these services without properly configuring them um, so uh, not to create undue concern, but essentially the the the, uh, the requirement is to um, make sure that <clears throat> the skill set exists within your organisation to um, to adequately secure uh, the services that you're that you're using. Um, and we talked about redistribution of skills um, uh, and shared responsibility. I think that can be. Uh, dealt with, with with additional training but also peer review so obviously there will be people in the organization with a better understanding of some things than others and, and whilst you're in perhaps a transitionary phase uh, making sure that um, uh, that, uh, that the team works together to identify the most secure way of uh, deploying something um, and then a security review regular security reviews audits uh, penetration tests etc etc uh, are advisable just to uh, make sure that what has actually been deployed uh, has been done so in the in the um, in the appropriate way. Uh, this graphic on the the right hand side here is, is one of the configuration windows in the Azure portal. Um, and if you can see uh, part of the way down, you know this is to to set up a, a virtual machine, but it's asking you about virtual networks, subnets, network security groups, and so forth. And further on, it will allow you to configure rules for network security and so forth. So there's quite a lot involved um, when you create a VM. Of, it's not just standing up a server, um, it's doing all the associated work as well. Um, in the UK, uh, ultimately what you're trying to um, deliver um, is adherence to the uh, NCSE cloud security principles, of which there are 14. Um, so I wouldn't worry about reading these for, for the moment, but um, you know, if you Google cloud security principles, you, you'll get the list and you'll get um, recommendations on how those are deployed. But it's worth saying um, that templates exist for uh, deployments that actually meet those cloud security principles. Um, uh, 
there are AWS templates and there are Azure templates. So here we have the AWS one on the left and the Azure one on the right. Um, I, I don't expect you to study these uh, uh, as they're on the screen here, but, but just to demonstrate how that they're here, there's a lot of backup content that goes along with these, um, breaking down exactly how uh, the infrastructure meets those cloud security principles uh, and also identifying any additional considerations that you should take um, in order to uh, maybe improve security um, uh, or uh, responsibilities that you have under that shared responsibility model to, to make sure that they're uh, sufficiently secure. Um, and then whilst we're talking about the, the feature sets of, um, of the public cloud, um, you know, there, there are tools and uh, and uh, systems uh, that are easily deployed to prevent um, uh, issues with um, particularly the fact that, that uh, more of your um, systems might be exposed to the internet, might have an internet interface uh, than, you, than you've had previously. Um, so obviously web application firewalls um, will, will sit at the front end of your application and, and monitor the traffic in and out of your application and, and flag up the most common um, issues uh, that are seen, uh, security issues that are seen um, and either proactively um, uh, put in controls to, 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 uh, to fix that uh, or, or alert you as the administrator of the system that there's, there's additional um, uh, security required or that you're, you're experiencing some sort of attack. Um, the graphic on the, on the right uh, is meant to illustrate a, a distributed denial of service attack. Um, so DDoS uh, you know, could be a real threat depending on your organization. So if, if somebody takes it upon themselves to uh, attack your web services or websites to prevent um, prevent you from going about your business or just to, to cause you problems, um, then uh, you know, DDoS uh, prevention uh, will, will help you. Um, the good thing about the public cloud is it has a, a level of that built in. Um, but uh, in its default state, um, it, it protects the, the platform as a whole. So if there's a, an attack against Azure or an attack against AWS, um, the, the, um, the, the staff uh, will um, uh, you know, do what they can to mitigate that. Um, you can then subscribe to additional uh, levels of DDoS protection, um, which will focus on your particular set of servers. So if you have four web servers and they're under <coughs> DDoS attack, um, that, uh, that that wouldn't be highly visible to um, to the Microsoft Azure platform um, because it's four servers and it's not 4,000 servers. Um, but by buying into that service, you're, you're uh, uh, allowing them to analyze traffic on your particular servers and uh, prevent DDoS uh, attacks. Um, and again, both Amazon and, and uh, and uh, Microsoft have um, uh, security services. So there's Amazon Guard Duty and others, um, Azure Security Center, um, that will advise you on the security uh, status of your uh, implementation, um, uh, whether you, you are uh, experiencing any form of attack, um, and will provide advice, you know, automated advice as to, to what you should do to prevent uh, uh, either. Um, future attacks or, or one that's currently underway. Um, so you, uh, you, you're buying into a, a, an infrastructure that has um, experts running it and can give you expert advice. So you, you're, you're extending your skill set, your, your security skill set um, by subscribing to these services. Um, so the last point um, on the first slide was around sensitive management interfaces. Um, so that by this, I mean, um, any interface that allows you to, to perform major reconfiguration of resources um, and privileged access to data, including the ability to delete data. So obviously um, th those interfaces exist and um, you can do an awful lot of damage um, through, those, uh, through those interfaces. So if you imagine in an on-premise environment, you know, someone with uh, administrative rights could also um, uh, you know, do quite a, quite a serious amount of damage, um, but it's it's harder. It's not all in one place. It's harder for them to completely destroy what you have. So, key thing to do is to um, protect those interfaces. Now, by default, 
<clears throat> you just need a, a username and password to get in. Um, that is not a good um, way to leave them. So when you deploy these sorts of services, um, there are uh, you know three approaches really. Uh, ensure that um, people are using strong passwords and that you're not using root accounts to access uh, and, and configure uh, services on a daily basis. <clears throat> Enabling um, two-factor authentication. So in the case of Amazon Web Services, you can do this via the Google Authenticator app on a mobile phone. Um, obviously gives you a more secure um, interface, but also um, restricting access to the management console to, to whitelisted IP addresses. Um, uh, it, it, you know, that takes a bit more configuration, but it, it's, it's available uh, in, in both Azure and AWS and, and probably uh, many other services. Um, you know, making sure that you don't box, you know, you know, prevent your the access that you need from from being available, uh, but ensuring that uh, you know, essentially only known networks that are able to access your uh, your management interface. Um, those those levels of uh, security um, on those interfaces are, are are wholly appropriate for for everyone. Um, so role based access control is um, essentially the um, it's, it's a way of implementing the least privileged policy. So making sure that uh, any user given their role only has the right to do what they're, um, what they are strictly required to do. Um, that means that um, you, you minimize the number of people who are able to do um, serious damage either by accident or on purpose. Um, and uh, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's good practice on on-premise solutions as well. Um, I think you know going back to the previous comment about the um, about management interfaces being available uh, and and being able to uh, configure all things in some way through those interfaces, um, the judicious use of of role based access control is, is pretty key to make sure that um, you don't uh, don't have too many people or, or ideally anyone that could actually uh, destroy your entire um, it uh, it system. Um, with that in mind, uh, it is recommended that um, some form of fail-safe account is used. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so essentially, you know, with a, within a cloud service, you would back up your data to another um, another location, much as you would um, uh, with an on-premise solution. So in on-premise world, you might might move tapes or, or disks or have disks in an alternate location. Um, uh, in in the public cloud, you would replicate or back up data to a um, to a facility that you know to be in a different data center, um, and that protects from system issues. Really, a fail-safe account protects you from the human issues of um, somebody catastrophically doing the wrong thing by mistake, uh, which might occur, or someone catastrophically doing the wrong thing um, because they're about to hand their notice in. Uh, you know, they're a disgruntled employee of some sort. Um, you know, essentially they have the, the ability to do that and they're going to choose to use it. Um, so previous comments uh, still apply. So, you know, trying to reduce the, the number of people uh, who, who are able to do that to, to, to zero, ideally. Um, but in terms of a fail-safe account, it would be an account that only can only be accessed by, <coughs> um, through authority, from a senior executive or you know uh, you know the senior information responsible officer CSIRO uh, might be the appropriate person uh, or might be a finance director or someone um, someone who probably on their own doesn't have the ability to to access the account because they don't have the, the technical uh, skill perhaps um, but they they can be the the, the uh, uh, gatekeeper of the uh, of the fail safe account and prevent access on a day-to-day -day basis uh, but if you absolutely need it if you need to rebuild your um, uh, your deployment in the public cloud um, uh, from scratch from from the backups that you you hold um, then uh, they would be available um, and sometime down the line you'd, you'd be up, back up and running so um, just to summarize um, we talked about um, security in terms of you know the, the specific nuances of security when it comes to deploying cloud services. Um, so security is a shared responsibility um, between you and the cloud service provider. 
uh, cloud security risks can be managed though and there are a wide range of controls so certainly do not intend to worry you by this uh, presentation um, as for on-premise deployments uh, risk assessments are important so understanding um, where the risks are where the threats are uh, and precisely what you're doing to mitigate those risks uh, is, is pretty key um, so you might do that um, uh, you know, at a sort of high level of granularity. So for, for, for a set of systems, but there might be specific systems uh, holding particularly sensitive data that you, you want to do a full risk assessment um, on, on the way it's deployed in the cloud. Um, staff cloud skill sets need to be developed to safeguard your systems and data. Uh, it's, a, it's a new set of skills. Um, even doing the same thing uh, as you do on premise, but in the public cloud, there are different buttons to press and boxes to tick. So training is key to make sure that the, the sufficient security is deployed. Um, and privileged access must be controlled and secure. So uh, look uh, look to uh, deploy the least privileged policy um, and uh, make sure that people only have the access rights that they need. And that is that. I do apologize for the uh, delay at the beginning, um, but if there are any questions, I think we've probably got time to take some questions. So I've got a hand raised indicator. Next to Ben Kessler. Uh, admin access um, to whitelist on Office 365. Uh, I think that was Ben's question. So, um, so yes. So <clears throat> the the particular feature of Office 365 that I was alluding to is something called um, uh, conditional access um, that can be configured for um, any of the Microsoft Cloud services. So, uh, in the case of the Azure Management Console, you do it for that, um, but you can also do it for um, Office 365 services. Um, so you can whitelist based on uh, IP address, should you wish. Um, you can also vary uh, the security stance. So you can, you know, you can enable um, uh, no MFA uh, from an internal network and MFA if you're on an external network. But it's uh, if, you, if you want to Google it, it's conditional access. Um, that's the, the element of Office 365. It's actually a feature of Azure Active Directory um, that, that enables it. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, I think that's it. I don't have any more questions on my screen, so thank you very, very much for attending. And one last apology for the uh, technical hitch at the beginning. Um, every day is a school day. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Bye.